Well, this is a fascinating week in the life of our nation. Again, the Supreme Court has ruled badly. They've been doing that since 1887, when they declared the Dred Scott decision, which involved slavery. And they've continued to do it with removing school prayer and so many other things, and so they did it again this week. Uh, I've changed their name. You can quote me if you'd like to. They are now the Supreme Corruptors. And I'm not really being funny. It's very serious. So we need to pray for those. Uh, really, it's God's judgment on our country in terms of the way it's going. So we need to be praying. I was thinking this morning as I was in church about what the rapture is going to be like. Have you ever been in a large crowd where lots of people entered at the same time? I never thought about this before. I thought about it while sitting in church this morning. Now, can you imagine when all of us are raptured? I wonder if God has a really good plan for us to all enter heaven at the same time. Can, can you imagine what it will be like? I think probably God is capable of handling that. Do you think? So I'm really looking forward to that. And when we get these kinds of rulings and these kinds of things going on in our nation, it makes me hungrier and hungrier and hungrier for heaven. And it was interesting while I was listening to the report, which I fully expected, by the way, I was studying about heaven. And I thought, oh my goodness, what a great thing to be doing. So that's what we want to think about. Is the world enough? And let me just tell you, if your life is totally disrupted by rulings from the Supreme Court or Congress or a state, then you're in trouble. Because if we're looking for any kind of satisfaction in this world, you're going to be disappointed. I don't know if you've ever paid much attention to tombstones. Have you ever looked at tombstones? Maybe it's something kind of strange about me, but when I've had a chance, when I'm around a cemetery, I love to read tombstones. And uh, I guess because I've been a pastor and done so many funerals, but some of them are wonderful. One of them I read, In Christ, and Alexander is not dead but lives. That was the tombstone. Oh, that's a good one. Another one I read is, One Who Lives with God. Most of the time it says, Beloved Mother and Grandmother, or something. I, I really like this better, one who lives with God. Uh, he was taken to his eternal home. Well, I thought you might enjoy seeing a few other tombstones. This one happens to be uh, Merv Griffin's. And it said, I will not be right back after this message. <laughs> now, if you'll remember, kind of his theme song was, I'll be right back after this message. So on his tombstone, you can see it, it's right there. I will not be right back after this message. And then I thought this one was kind of interesting. It says, the joke's over, let me out right now. Well, it is no joke. Scripture really talks about the fact it's appointed on the man that wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Scripture says over and over again that this is our blessed hope as Christians. So in Philippians 1, 21 and 23, Paul says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he says, I desire to be part and be with Christ, which is better by far. Now, I've shared with you before this phrase I hear people use a lot. And they say, how are you? And they say, well, pretty good considering the alternative. Well, for the Christian, what is the alternative to life? It's eternal life and to be with the Lord. Matter of fact, Scripture says that everything we look forward to as Christians is in heaven. There is nothing, David says, I desire on earth because God is the desire of my heart. And I love the way Paul said it. I desire to depart and be with Christ which is far better. Do you? Amen. Now, I think sometimes we have crazy things we say. Well, I don't want to die yet because I want to see my grandchildren married, as if that would be better than being with the Lord. You see how empty that is? Well, it's not wrong, and I understand that. I have grandsons, and I'd love to see them married and what my great-grandchildren might look like. But I must tell you, I'm not going to stay here to find out if God wants to take me to heaven. Amen. 
So I love what Paul said. And then he says it this way, which is perhaps even more profound. He says, as long as we are at home in the body, that's right now in this moment, we're away from the Lord. Do you let that sink in a minute? As long as we're here, we're away from the Lord, Paul says. We would prefer to be away from here, the body, and be at home with the Lord. So I wonder, is that true of you? You see, the real test of that comes when we start getting into physical trouble, for example. In John 14, 2, Jesus is the speaker and he says, In my Father's house are many rooms. It's not mansions, by the way. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So part of what we're looking forward to when we think about heaven is this place that God is preparing. So how do you feel about heaven? Well, if you understand heaven right, you feel differently about death. And it's amazing to me, death is one of those things that is not spoken in polite company. If you start talking about death to people, they're going to put you in some kind of a weird category. And yet I want you to think a little with me about death. Do you realize that three people die every second? Somewhere in the world, three people die every second. That's 180 every minute, 11,000 every hour, 250,000 every day, but they either go to heaven or hell. You see, it's not death and no longer existent. It's either they go to eternal heaven or to eternal hell. In Psalm 39, verse 4 and 5, it says, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days, and let me know how fleeting is my life. Do you ever think about it? I've told you that I have a tradition that many times when I give somebody a birthday card, I will see how old they are, and then I'll look about the average length of time, maybe even being pretty extravagant, say, okay, you're going to live 90 years, and I say, you have so many days left to live. What are you going to do with them? Now, I've got a lot of interesting comments about that when I do that. <laughs> Those who are really spiritual have said, John, thank you. That's really a good reminder. People who have no spirit biblical discernment at all will either laugh it off or say, that's in poor taste. Well, I've got a good biblical base. Scripture says we should number our days. You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my life is nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. And you ever think about that? Your life is just a breath. <coughs> and yet sometimes it seems like life is interminably long. And yet the older I get, it seems like it's getting shorter and shorter. We've looked at this passage many times before, Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. So heaven should be the focus of the Christian's life. Now my question is, are you unfastened from the earth? And I think many of us are so strongly connected to earthly things that we don't think heavenly. And that's what we're trying to change because of our study these days and thinking about heaven. Now, these are fascinating tidbits of history. The ancient mayor and merchants of days gone by would often write in the front of their accounting books, Memento Mori, which said, think of death. Now, can you imagine if you were accountant and every time you opened your books, that's what you'd say, think of death. It was in large letters on the first page. In other words, it said, live in light of what you're going to reap when you die. Uh, Philip uh, Mankton, father of Alexander the Great, I know you all knew him, right? <laughs> he commissioned a servant to stand in his presence each day and said, Philip, you will die. <clears throat> now, can you, can you think of that? He wanted to have a clear understanding that what he was doing today had eternal <coughs> consequences. On the other hand, Francis Louis XIV, the, the, uh, 
decreed that the word death should never be spoken in his presence. And if you know much about that man, you'll see why. All right, so death is inevitable. How do we look at it? Well, I think a great story can help us with this. Do you all know Florence Chadwick? Uh, in San Diego, where I grew up, there was a Chadwick's Fist restaurant named after her. And I remember her very much. She was very famous in San Diego. And she swam between Catalina and Los Angeles. A remarkable swimmer. But the first time she tried it, she swam for 15 hours. She was finally exhausted and emotionally just over the hill. And so she stopped swimming and pulled into the boat, and she was less than a half a mile from shore. And she said at the end of it, I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. And friends, that's what heaven is. When you live in light of seeing the shore, there's a great song I love, think of stepping on shore and finding it of heaven of breathing new air and finding it in God's. So that's what heaven is. Jonathan Edwards, probably the finest preacher in the history of the United States, said, it becomes us to spend this life only as a journey toward heaven. You catch that? Let me say that afraid again. That we see this life only as a journey toward heaven, to which we should subordinate all other concerns of life. Why should we labor for or set our hearts on anything less but that which is our proper end and true happiness? And so he had a number of resolutions he made about his life, and this was one of them. He said, resolve to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can. So I wonder how we're doing. Are we sacrificing happiness in heaven? or the things of earth that will pass away. So how do you think about heaven? Awful lot of people say it's boring. It was interesting on the steps of the Supreme Court this week. Uh, it, I'm reading from an article on the defenders of Proposition 8, and they said, for example, I saw a pro-grade marriage activist, a man dressed in a rainbow-colored tunic, pink high heels, perfect lipstick, and a pair of devil's horns, and he was dancing on the courthouse steps, waving a wooden crucifix in one hand, and the other hand that, that, that said a uh, sign, I bet hell is fabulous. Now, see, so, yeah, that's the thing somebody says in the end for a surprise. We know from our earlier studies what, heaven, what hell is going to be like, but there's an awful lot of people who think hell will be much more exciting than heaven. And part of it, friends, is because we as a church have done such a horrible job of teaching anything biblical about heaven. Matter of fact, an awful lot of people have said, well, what heaven will be is an unending church service. And if that's what it's going to be, the boring comes to mind. Now, I love church services, but I would not like to spend eternity just in one endless church service. No, even if I was a preacher, it still would. <laughs> That's not what heaven is going to be like. Some people think we float around strumming harps and we look like Gerber babies. And I've told you, that offends me. Because angels are not Gerber babies. They are, are very strong, fierce warriors. And they're male. You find that in Scripture. So we're not going to be floating around strumming harps. One of the phrases that people use an awful lot about heaven is it's the better place. Somebody dies and, and somebody will say, well, they're in a better place. Well, is that all heaven is, is a better place? And what's really interesting is 78% of people say it's a place where people exist only spiritually. And the Bible talks very prominently about the fact that we're going to have new bodies. They're going to be just like Jesus' body. And the things that Jesus did, he ate, drank, walked, went through walls, moved from one place to another, all kinds of interesting things. We're going to have the same kind of a body. So that starts to put a little different color on heaven. There's a far sight cartoon. You know that one? They're just kind of interesting. And it showed a man with angel's wing and a halo sitting on a cloud doing nothing with nobody nearby. And the caption said, sure wish I'd brought a magazine. <laughs> See, that's what a lot of people think about heaven. 
that it is, I sure wish I'd brought a magazine. Charles Spurgeon said, one of the finer preachers ever born, to come to thee is to come home from exile, to come land out of the raging storm, to come to rest after long labor, to come to the goal of my desires and the summit of my wishes. That's heaven. But we have neglected heaven. Matter of fact, I don't remember in my ministry and life growing up in the church ever hearing anybody else preach a series on heaven. I've heard a sermon once in a while on heaven, but we've been at it now about 10 weeks and we got a ways to go yet because I really want us to get this. We don't hear people talking about the judgments that come. We don't hear longing about heaven. We don't talk and hear about the dread of hell. They're just ignored today. Now, when I was growing up, I remember we preached differently about heaven and hell. And because of it, I think we were a better culture. Matter of fact, the majority of people believe in heaven and hell, but their ideas are not based on the Bible whatsoever. They're just wishful dreaming. There's no fact or purpose to it. And I'm convinced that this neglect is the work of Satan. John 8.44 says, When Satan lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of law. So this man on the steps of the Supreme Court has bought that lie, hook, line, and sinker, that heaven will be a jolly good place and all my friends are going there, so that's where I want to be. Hell, thank you. And so we saw in our studies of hell how awful it's going to be. Revelation 13, 6, it says, He, the Antichrist of the tribulation, opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. So the devil will just absolutely uh, be mean, destroy, and defeat us about the subject of what heaven is really like. And we see it all the way through history. Satan's goal is to get us to believe that heaven is boring so that he can rob us of our joy and anticipation. And we will set our minds on this life and not eternity and have no motivation to share the truth of heaven or hell. And that's Satan's work. So how do we know about heaven? And I've told you, and, I, and I'm unapologetic about this, that the popular books that are being written about heaven today are garbage. There's no biblical base for them whatsoever. It says it's appointed on the man once to die and after that the judgment. The only way that you can test any book that's written by someone who supposedly went to heaven and came back is to say, does it agree with the book of Revelation? And you see, none of those books are inspired and Revelation is. So I'm just kind of amused, maybe a little more disgusted, that people will much more quickly buy a book about a little boy who supposedly went to heaven and came back and never even open the book of Revelation. And in the little book by the little boy, there's nothing in it that God said, blessed is the person who reads this book. Revelation does have that definition in the start of it. Matter of fact, Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So there's one sense in which, can any of us know? Well, the next verse says, but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. We can know from Scripture a great deal about heaven. Can we know everything? No. But can we know a lot? Yes. And we've got weeks to go to be able to help you see all of that. The most exciting coming in a couple of weeks from now where I'm going to share something with you. I think you probably know. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, The th secret things belong to God. But these things have been revealed. They belong to us and to our children forever that we might follow all the words of this law. So my question is, how often do you talk about heaven with your children and your grandchildren? Is it ever a part of your conversation? And you see the scripture says right here, God has revealed it to us, and notice this, and to our children. How is he going to reveal it to our children? It has to come through us. Well, that's back to our Colossians 3.1. Keep setting your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Diligently, actively, singly, mindedly pursue the things that are above. 
There's a great old song that we used to sing when I was a boy, and it's called Until Then. It says the things of earth will grow dim and lose their value. If we recall, they're borrowed for a while. And things of earth that cause the heart to tremble, remember there will only bring a smile. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eye beholds the city. Until the day God calls me home. I wonder, are you one of those until then kind of people? And the real test of it is how often do the things of earth steal us of our heavenly joy? So how do you know if you're going to heaven? Well, for some of you, this is great review, but I, every once in a while, want to go over it because I'm utterly convinced there are people sitting in this room who think they're going to heaven and aren't. Some of you who've been in, your church, in the church your whole life and you have no clue that Christ does not reside in you. And I can't tell you how concerned I am about that. So I want again, probably we'll do it many times, to just review for you how do we know for sure we're going to heaven. One of the most wonderful things about heaven is there's no sin there. Now if you let that sink in, there's both joy there and there's a reason to be scared to death there. There is no sin in heaven. But in Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What's the word all mean? All. Right, would you turn to the person next to you and just tell them you're a sinner? <laughs> We're a little too enthusiastic about that. I guess. <laughs> All right, so the Bible says every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what does that tell us? Not one of us has the right to go to heaven because there is no sin there. By the grace of God. Now, I mean, that seems so incredibly simple to me. But I don't think we think that way. Matter of fact, in Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin is death, and that word death means eternal separation from God in hell. So we know that every one of us in this room are sinners. The Bible tells us that. In matter of fact, in 1 John, it says to the person who says, I don't sin, you're a liar. Make God to be a liar. And now you got sin. All right, so we're in trouble. Do you see the problem? If there is no sin in heaven, how in the world can you get there? Heaven is not our default destination. And you'll find the majority of people believe that. They believe as long as you do the best you can, somehow or other you'll get to heaven. But God says if there's any sin on you at all, you cannot go there. That's what's so serious about the way we think, or more likely don't think at all, about heaven and hell. It's not our default situation. Matter of fact, in John 3, 16 through 18, everybody knows 16, but hear how it goes on. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But now notice next. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but does... Uh, okay, that looks like I got that wrong. But does not he who does not believe stands condemned already, because he does not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. Now the important thing is, Scripture says, if we do not believe in Jesus Christ... We stand condemned. Mm -hmm. And what does that condemnation mean? No entrance into heaven, and you're going to hell. That's what the scripture tells us. Now here's the other side, the good news. Revelation 6.23, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. Now the question is, have you believed that? says, nothing impure will enter the city, that's talking about Jerusalem, heaven, 
nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And those are the people who are going to heaven. The people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life have received the gift that Jesus Christ has given. So my question is, have you RSVP'd to God's invitation? John 5, 1 John 5, 11, 13. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in religion. No? Okay, all right. Uh, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in sincerity. No, no, no. Okay, well, let's see if I can try something else. Um, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in my opinion of how good I'm doing. You see the problem? It says there's only one place that eternal life is, and it's in his Son, Jesus Christ. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Can you get it any clearer than that? I write these things to you who believe in the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. So what is the entrance into heaven? It's receiving Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Now let me just go over this very quickly. It means, number one, I admit that I have a need. I am a sinner. If you have any doubt, the person next to you will be glad to tell you again. <laughs> Based on Romans 3.23, you are a sinner. That's my need. And God says no sin will enter heaven. So the first step in becoming a Christian is admitting that and saying, God, I'm wrong. I deserve to go to hell because I'm a sinner and no sin can enter heaven. That's what repentance is. Secondly, I simply accept the gift of God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. See, this is the amazing thing to me. It's so simple. God says you're a sinner, you're earning a wage, it's going to send you to hell. God has given you a gift, and if you receive the gift, you will be forgiven, and you can go to heaven. What's there complicated about that? Absolutely nothing. But scripture says, if I have not received the gift, then I'm not going to go to heaven. And a lot of people say, well, that's not just. Well, all right, you can take that up with God later if you want to. But God tells us this is the way he sees it, and he's given you a gift, and you receive it, or you don't. Now, this is the important part. If we have received that gift, there must be some evidence that something has happened. And so we amend our lives around the lordship and ownership of Christ. And the only thing that really indicates if we are a Christian, is there evidence that God belongs to us and we belong to him and we live like it. And so then we abide in dependence on the new creative work of Christ. It's that simple. That's the gospel as short as I know how to give it to you. I have a need. I accept God's gift for that need. I amend my life around the lordship and ownership of Christ, and I invite independence on him. That's what it takes to become a Christian. And then if you have a question about that and you're not sure about it, I'll be up in the worship center afterwards, or welcome center, and delight to speak to you about it. It really boils down to this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. John 1, 12 and 13. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of a natural descent, nor of human decision, but born of God. So what do you know about this heaven? There's the way to get there. Revelation chapter 21, 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. They will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And then this is the most important phrase. The old order of things has passed away. The thing I like the most about heaven is the curse of the fall that happened in Genesis 3 will be gone. All of it will be gone. When Adam and Eve sinned, everything was ruined. When we go to heaven, everything will be restored. And so Isaiah 6, 1 to 5 says, I saw the Lord. The angels were calling to one another, Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth 
is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. That's what it takes to be saved. When you see God, you realize that you're ruined. And Jesus Christ has made a way for you to be restored. As early as Genesis 3.15, we have the promise that heaven will fulfill everything that was stolen from us at the fall. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offsprings and her. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And that's talking about the crucifixion and ultimately then about the destruction of Satan into hell itself. Matthew 25, 34, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's what the Christian has to look forward to. God's plan throughout all the ages has been to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, who is Christ, and that we will reign with him. Heaven has been the abode of God, and the earth the abode of man. Now in the new heaven and the new earth, they will be brought together under Christ. And we'll see this more in days that are coming ahead, but God will descend onto the new earth, and he will be here with us, much like Adam and Eve were in the garden, but so much better. So in Revelation 21.3, it says, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And that's what heaven is like. Uh, there's this old hymn, I've always been one of my favorites, This is My Father's World. And in that uh, hymn is this phrase, Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Ephesians 1, 18 to 23 puts it this way, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened, in order that you might know the hope to which you were called, the riches of your glorious inheritance in his holy people, and the incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills everything and in every way. That's what heaven is going to be like. Everything will live under the authority of Jesus Christ. There will no longer be any curse. That phrase is so profound. Genesis 3.17, after Adam's sin, God said, cursed is the ground because of him. At the creation of the new heaven and the new earth, that curse will be removed. And in our resurrected bodies, we will again dwell on the new earth, completely free from the curse. The phrase in the song, Joy to the World, says, No more let sin and sorrow grow, or thorns invest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. So the curse will be completely done away with. And there will be a restoration like we've never known before. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Romans 8.18-23, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, by, by, by the will of the one who subjected it, that's God, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. Now you catch that? It says it will be brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. That's us. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth birth right up into the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Now, so do you. Are you eagerly waiting and anticipating and longing for heaven? 
Hebrews 11, 13 to 14 and 16 puts it this way. All these people were still living by faith when they died. And there's this long list of people who live by faith there. And they did not receive the thing's province. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on the earth. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. Instead, of they're looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Or first, uh, second Peter, and Peter talks a lot about this because he's writing to people who are going under incredible suffering. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with them. The news this morning was that John Kerry, our uh, um, Secretary of State, was announcing that he feels that we're very close to a peace uh, agreement between the Arabs, Palestinians, and the Jews. Now you laugh. No, no. Scripture says this is going to happen. Matter of fact, it says it is the event that will trigger the start of the tribulation period. And if it happens, and he's suggesting it could happen in days, guess where we are? We're right on the doorpost of the tribulation. Closer to home. And I've tried to teach you that my feeling is, biblically, that God will take us out before the tribulation begins. That's why I was sitting in church this morning wondering what it was going to be like when we all enter heaven at the same time. Because I was thinking it could have happened right then or right now. So the issue is, are you ready? Are you anticipating it? I love the way 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, in light of our resurrection, dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. I wish we could go around with a microphone and just say, All right, tell me what robs you of your joy spiritually. Tell me what it is. My guess is there's something every one of us would have to admit. There is something that easily discourages us or defeats us. I don't know what it is for you. But the scripture tells us we are to stand firm and let nothing move us. Why? Always give yourself partially to the work of the Lord. No, it says give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Do you? There have been many of us who have been working and giving somehow to defeat this horrible desecration of marriage. And it looks like the Supreme Court in a stroke has wiped it out and the battle is lost. Not entirely, other things are going on, but it looks that way. And do you ever feel like, well, I'm just never going to vote in an election again, I'm not going to do anything again, I'm going to climb in my hole, pull the dirt over my head, and wait for glory. That's not what Scripture says. That we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, there's a song I was going to play, and I'm not going to play it today. We'll do it more, but I want to just have you think with me about it. This man is giving his testimony. And he talks about how he started out early trusting the Lord and all the rest of it. And then he says, I'm determined. I've got a made-up mind. I can't stand around wasting my time. I'm going to keep on working for Jesus every day of my life because I got heaven on my mind. I wonder, friends, do you have heaven on your mind? And for so many of us, it's just some kind of crazy escapism. Not that for the Christian. Everything I long for is there. 
and then we start to see this in days coming and we start to look at more of the details of it, I'm hoping you're going to get so hungry for heaven that the things of earth are not going to mean a whole lot to you anymore. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that heaven is worthy of our study. And I thank you that it's not some wishful dream, it's not some elusive idea. You've given us lots of indication about what heaven's going to be like, and we're going to see that in days coming yet. But I pray that you'd help us in light of heaven to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. And we expect that these final days as we move toward the tribulation and Armageddon are going to get worse and worse and worse. And we ought not to be surprised. And Peter even tells us, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that are coming your way. I pray because we have our eyes set on heaven, we've got heaven on our mind, that we won't sit around wasting our time. That we'll give ourselves diligently, fervently to the work of the Lord. And it will bring about in us a wonderful understanding of your eternal plan to restore everything in Jesus Christ, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. I pray for the person who has never really come to the place where they've seen their need of you for Savior. That this phrase, there will be no sin in heaven, will cause them to look closely at your invitation, your gift to be forgiven and cleansed in Jesus Christ. It would be my prayer, Lord, that nobody in this room would reject that gift <coughs> and upon their death hear the God say, depart from me, I never knew. So I pray, Lord, in these days that are coming that you give us a deeper understanding and, yes, a greater hunger for heaven. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>